French literature is really good. I think a lot of people will agree, but quite often when we talk about French literature, like English literature, we often talk about the classics. The English, the French, and the Russians are known for their great classic works of literature from the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries. I don't want to talk about any of that stuff today, though. I want to talk about some great works of modern French literature, stuff that's come out in the last 50 years, 10 years, even one year. I want to talk about some of the great works of literature coming from France, translated into English by some really great translators that we can all check out and read right now. First up is this, which I think at the time of recording has just been released as a film on Amazon Prime. Not sure. Think so. I didn't actually know that until I picked it up and someone told me, oh, that's about to be a film. And I was like, well, that's fortuitous, isn't it? The Mad Women's Ball by Victoria Maas is translated by Frank Wynne. The translation here is absolutely stellar. So that's number one. Number two, this is a very feminist novel that succeeds and doesn't succeed in equal parts for me. And the biggest reason that it doesn't really succeed is the ending, which I'm not going to talk about, but the ending is very rushed. And I feel like it had a, a theme that it was developing, very obviously, and a point that it was leading to, and then it just kind of bleh, just dies at the end, I guess. So apart from the rushed ending, this is a really, really great book. First off, the cover is stunning. Dunning. This is one of my favourite book covers I think I've ever seen. The Mad Women's Ball is a novel set in the very late 19th century in Paris, and it's the story of two protagonists, two women, one of whom is a nurse at a women's madhouse. This asylum is called Salpetriere. I think it was a real place. And we have our nurse, Genevieve. She's like the head nurse. She's just underneath the doctor, who of course is a man who heads up the whole thing. And he has this new form of medicine that he is attempting and ab approaching women's mental health with. Throughout history, especially European history, we know it to be true, everyone knows that hysteria, all of these things that women were supposed to have were just ways of patriarchal men, husbands, fathers, whatever, to just throw their women in a madhouse and say, be gone, I can't be dealing with you. And Dr. Charco, who runs the Salpetria, is being a little bit kinder about it and saying, no, there are several different things and he's trying to treat them, but again, in a very 19th century kind of way. But Genevieve truly believes in what Dr. Charco is trying to do. And and then we move to our other protagonist, Eugenie. Eugenie is the daughter of a very bourgeois Paris family. She has a brother who's really nice to her, a grandmother who is nice to her, until she isn't, I guess, and a father who is an absolute monster. And he will take any excuse to just throw her in the madhouse, and eventually he does. The story begins with her discussing things with her family and asserting herself as a young feminist woman who isn't going to take crap from no man. She also happens to be able to see and communicate with ghosts for real. Ever since she was about 12 years old, she's been able to see her grandfather's ghost. She tells her grandmother that she can see her husband, and she proves it, and the grandmother goes, wow, I believe you, and then immediately tells her son, or is it son-in-law? I don't know. Tells Eugenie's dad, and Eugenie's dad goes, right, off to the madhouse with you. And from there on, the story is Eugenie and Genevieve kind of tied together in the Salpetria, and I won't tell you any more than that. But this is a story of women's oppression by the patriarchy, which is a tale as old as time at this point. So many of the great feminist works of literature of the last few years have been about that. Many of my favorite novels have been feminist novels that have dissected and attacked the patriarchy, and I love them. I love them all, and I love this one too, apart from the fact that the ending is a bit rushed. Next is this. A Single Rose by Muriel Barbary. Muriel Barbary is quite a legend of modern French literature, and this is translated by Alison Anderson, who's done a really nice job here. By the way, Gallic sent us this, and I'm really grateful this is a review copy. Thank you, Gallic. What really caught my eye is the fact that it's set in Kyoto, and it's supposed to be a love letter to the city of Kyoto. I love the city of Kyoto. Anyone who's visited it typically does. It's a really, really beautiful place in terms of human history and the nature that surrounds it. And that's really what you're getting here in A Single Rose. But it's also a really sad and poignant story about a woman who lived a life that feels a little bit empty. The titular Rose is a 40-year-old woman from France who had a Japanese dad she never knew, ever. She never met him. Her mother raised her alone in France, 
and now her Japanese dad has died and she's gone to Kyoto for the reading of the will. And also, I guess, whether she'll admit it to herself or not, to try to learn a little bit about the dad she never knew. When she gets there, she finds out from Paul, who's this Belgian guy who worked for her dad for many, many years. Paul explains to Rose that her dad was an art dealer. And so he was in the art scene of Kyoto for his entire adult life. And it made him very, very wealthy. And now he's dead. And lucky for Rose, he was rich. But this really isn't about that. What it's about is the fact that she's angry that she never knew her dad, while Paul is insisting to her, your dad did love you, I promise. I know he did. He used to talk about you all the time, and he would get updates about you from France and boast about you to people. And so Paul is trying to convince her of her dad's love, but she never experienced it. So does it really matter? Does it really count? Love is only love if you can feel it, right? And she never felt it. She never knew. So this is a simple story. We've seen it before. We've seen this kind of a relationship between a person and their parent before. It's not new, but it definitely still tugs at your heartstrings. What also tugs at your heartstrings is how beautifully Kyoto itself is depicted. This truly is a love letter to that city. It's gorgeous. From the bamboo forest to the temples to just the streets, the modern streets of Kyoto and the Gion district and the geisha and all of this stuff that really you do see all the time when you go to Kyoto. It really is partly for the tourists, partly for tradition and it's all here in a single rose, and it's really beautifully written and beautifully depicted. Next up, I wanna talk about a book that I've already covered in its own separate video, but it deserves to be mentioned here, and that is At Night All Blood Is Black by David Diop, translated from French by Anna Moshevakis. This book won the Booker International Prize 2021. Yeah? Yeah. It's set during World War I, I do not like war. I am a pacifist. I am not a nationalist in any way, shape, or form, but I do like stories that are set during wartime, especially World Wars 1 and 2. Modern warfare? No. But trench warfare? I don't know what it is about the setting. I just enjoy it. Call it a guilty pleasure. And I also like the fact that a lot of books set during World War 1 and 2 are usually anti-war books. Anti-war poetry by Sassoon and Owen. I love these poems. The novels of Pat Barker, the Regeneration Trilogy, etc, etc. I like this stuff. And At Night All Blood Is Black is no exception. This is a hundred page novel that you can read in an afternoon and it hits you really hard. It's very anti-war, it's very anti-racism, and it's also very anti-toxic masculinity. These are kind of the big themes of the book. You've got war, you've got race, and you've got masculinity. The race part comes from the fact that the protagonist is a Senegalese man who is fighting for the French army in the trenches during World War I, and is facing a lot of racism from the white French soldiers. But the way that they exoticize him while also ostracizing him is both an examination of racism and brotherhood camaraderie and masculinity. And it tackles these things in a really, really brutal way, and I guess that's partly why it's set during war, to make the themes as hard-hitting as possible. And so the setting kind of matches the brutality of the themes that David Diop is addressing. The, the setting, the characters, and the themes all kind of merge together in this really raw and brutal and frightening way. Next up is another favorite of mine. This is one of my favorite modern French novels, and it is The Collection by Nina Legere, translated by Laura Francis. I love this book. I said before when I talked about the Mad Women's Ball that a lot of modern literature by women is very feminist, very anti-patriarchy, and a lot of them approach patriarchy in a really tongue-in-cheek way, in a way that is almost designed to just piss men off. The collection by Nina Legere tells the story of a young Parisian woman who loves dicks. She loves collecting them in her mind. Uh, let me explain. <laughs> Where do you even begin? She's a woman who loves having sex and she loves men's bodies. She has a kink where she likes to go to hotel rooms with men, enjoy herself, and kind of take a mental photo of their penis and put it away in a little gallery in her mind. And she has this enormous gallery in her mind of all the different penises she's ever seen. She just really loves them. She just thinks they're great. And this is a inversion of the fact that men objectify women physically and have done always. But you know how a lot of men are gonna read this book and just be upset by it. Great. This is a celebration of femininity. It's a celebration of kink. 
It is pointing out the toxicity of slut shaming, which is something I dearly despise. It does a lot of things. It is a gorgeously, gloriously feminist novel. It's a celebration of women doing whatever they want sexually with permission. She's not a, an abuser in any way. She just really likes mental images of penises. More power to her. I really hope that last one wasn't gonna get me demonetized. Guess I'll find out. A Winter's Promise by Christelle Dabos is translated by Hildegard Searle. Christel Dabos, Hildegard Searle, those are two of the greatest names I've ever heard in my entire life. I haven't actually read this book, but my partner has, and I have relied on her to explain the plot to me. This is a YA fantasy novel. It is the first in a series called The Mirror Visitor, and I am desperate to read this series. It's set on a big floating island called an Ark. There are a bunch of these different arcs, and it's got a Palace of Versailles kind of political system mixed with a Pride and Prejudice love story. That's how Jess framed it for me, and I was immediately intrigued. Our protagonist is a young woman who, when she touches objects, she's able to see their history and their past. And everyone on her arc has some sort of ability related to objects, and hers is that. And so she works in a museum that's run by her grandfather, and she is set up in a arranged marriage to this guy from another arc who has been ostracized from his family for being a bastard, I think. And he's not a very nice guy, but the two of them have been forced into a marriage together. And I think they hate each other at first and then end up sort of learning to like each other. That's as much as I know. It's YA fantasy, it's supposed to have fantastic world building, and Versailles politics mixed with Pride and Prejudice in a fantasy world on a floating island very much sounds like the kind of thing I'm going to enjoy. I hope it's great. The Reader's Room by Antoine Lorraine. This was also sent to us by Gallic. Gallic are awesome. The Reader's Room is translated by Jane Aitken, and it is very much an Agatha Christie style murder mystery novel. I really, really enjoyed this. It is twee, charming, sweet. It's very Agatha Christie. That is the best way to sell it. But what I really liked about it beyond the Christiness of it is that it's set in a publishing house in Paris. It's about the woman who runs the publishing house. She is sent a manuscript as she is almost every day. And she reads the manuscript and she goes, oh ho ho. <laughs> Sorry, that sounded French. She goes, ooh, I like this manuscript. Uh, it sounds really, really good. And I want to publish it. I don't know who sent it though. The, the person has kept their identity secret. And so she publishes it anyway, but when it is nominated for a prize, in order to receive that prize, the person must come forward. And while that's going on, there are actual deaths that happen in the real world that weirdly coincide with the events of the novel. And so, of course, when the police figure this out and are told about the connections between this novel and real life murders that are happening, they go to the publishing house and the woman is now tied up in this murder mystery because she published the book and because she doesn't know who the author is. I won't tell you any more than that. It's a really, really charming book. It has that Agatha Christie feel to it, while also giving you some insight into the inner workings of publishing houses, which I personally find fascinating. This next one is an absolute favorite of mine. This is The Office of Gardens and Ponds by Didier de Coyne, translated by Ewan Cameron. This is another French book set in Japan, but it's so clever. I, oh, I love this book. Okay, so it's set about a thousand years ago in a small province in Japan, and it's about a fisherman who collects these koi fish from the local river, and these koi fish are particularly beautiful fish. And so one of his jobs, besides being a fisherman, is to periodically, once a year, I think, take a bunch of these fish alive, on foot, all the way to Heian, which then became Kyoto, the capital of Japan. He has to take these fish all the way to the capital on foot so that the emperor can put them in his pond because they are his favorite fish and he always wants new ones every so often. But at the beginning of the novel, this fisherman dies, and so it's up to his wife to take on that responsibility. And she does. She catches the fish, and she sets out on a journey, and that's where the novel really begins. She goes on a journey to the capital on foot, and you follow her on this journey for the first half of the novel, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful journey while she's trying to keep these fish safe, and there are people she meets and inns that she stays at along the way. But in the second half of the novel, we are in the court of Heian, and the novel kind of switches 
to this competition within the capital where all of the bourgeois assholes are trying to create a perfume. There's this perfume making contest that they do, and one of them wants to create a perfume using our fisherwoman's scent. And it's about the exoticization of poor countryside rural people in touch with nature by these gross rich people in the capital. It's absolutely fantastic. These people have built up this idea, this romanticized idea of countryside people. They smell of dirt and nature and it's rugged and, oh, isn't her scent fascinating? Not because she's a woman, it's not creepy in that way, it's creepy in the classist kind of a way. And it's fantastic. It's really hard hitting, it's really smart. I've never seen a novel tackle class in this way before. And also the setting, the characters, the story, the journey, all of it is absolutely beautiful. Apparently, this novel took Didier de Coin about 14 years to write, and, well, I think it was worth it. Next is another novel that I really, really enjoyed, The Revolt by Clara dupont monod translated by Ruth Diver. I'm trying to keep all this in my head. The Revolt is a very short 200-page book with a gorgeous cover, and it tells the story of the 12th century Queen of France and England, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and it tells the story from the perspective of her son, Richard Lionheart. It pretty much covers her entire life. You're getting a 200-page, medieval, fantasy-inspired epic told from the perspective of a second character about a first character in a Holmes and Watson kind of a way. So, structurally, thematically, setting-wise, character-wise, there is a lot going on in this book for 200 pages. And the length is something I really enjoyed because it means that there's no filler, there's no padding, there's no slowing down. This is a book that is a joy to read from beginning to end. In 200 pages, you're getting all of the biggest highlights of the life and personality and exploits and events of Eleanor of Aquitaine, told from the perspective of her son who really loved and admired her. I really, really enjoyed this book, and if you haven't read it already, please, please check it out. The Revolt is awesome. This is one that I actually did a dedicated review of, but I don't think many people watched, and it is Self-Portrait in Green by Marie Ndiaye, translated by Jordan Stump. Self-Portrait in Green is apparently what happened when Marie Ndiaye was asked to write an autobiography or a memoir. And what she came out with was a really strange and surreal piece of pseudo autofiction, I guess. Yeah, let's call it autofiction. The novel begins with a river in a small town that is supposed to burst its banks and flood the town. We then move to a first person narrative where I guess Marie, let's call her Marie, Marie is driving along with her children in the car and she's constantly on the way to school driving past this cottage in the countryside with a woman dressed in green in the garden. One day she stops the car and she says to her kids, like, what's with that woman? And the kids can't see the woman. And so as the book goes on, Marie Ndiaye is experiencing women in green. Sometimes they're strangers, like the woman in the garden. Other times they are women that she knows, family members and friends, who are always women who are dressed in green. And you come to realize that green represents to her things in her life that she regrets, things that she missed out on, and more obviously because it's the color green, jealousy. The women around her are making her jealous and are symbolizing certain feelings of negativity that Marie and D.I. has. It's written like a very surreal and strange piece of fiction that moves back and forth over the course of a two-year period around 2002-2003. And I really enjoyed it. It's autofiction in the truest sense, because it really is true to her life and her personal experiences and the way that she sees and interprets her own life while being a very surreal piece of fiction. You can certainly read it that way, at least. Next one is An Apartment on Uranus by Paul B. Preciado. I'm so excited to get to talk about this. I've never mentioned it in a video before. It's published by Fitzcarraldo Editions, who are one of my favorite indie publishers in the UK. Big shout out to Fitzcarraldo, always. An Apartment on Uranus, I have a wonderful memory of reading this book while I was on a bus going through Transylvania and I really enjoyed that. It was a great setting for this book. Paul B. Preciado speaks English, French, and Spanish, and has lived in multiple places. 
He is a nomad of sorts, just like myself, and he's also a trans man. And this is a book that is telling two stories. It's an autobiography of sorts, almost like a diary, I guess. In fact, yeah, let's call it a diary. And it's telling two stories, one of his physical journeys around the world and the things that he's seen and done and the people that he's met, and also his journey of transitioning as a trans man. Paul B. Preciado is a fascinating person, and he's very, very knowledgeable. He he is a very far-left socialist, again, like myself, and he is just remarking on the state of the world. And this book goes around the world to many different places. At one point, he goes shopping in San Francisco with Annie Sprinkle. If you don't know who she is, look her up, but she was a bit of an icon for me when I was at university. Annie Sprinkle was amazing. Is she dead? I'm not sure. She might be dead. Can't remember. Oh, is she dead? I don't know. Anyway, Annie Sprinkle is, was awesome. And so Paul B, all the way through the book, is discussing politics, discussing trans rights and trans representation, discussing his own transition and his own personal experiences with his body, dysphoria, etc. But it's mostly ranting about politics. He's really eloquent when he discusses party politics and governments, etc. While also just kind of telling us stories of things that he's seen around the world. An apartment on Uranus is absolutely worth checking out. If you haven't, yeah, read this. It's great. I have no idea how many books I've covered, but I'm gonna go with one more that I read very recently, courtesy of my friend Ian, who sent this to me. Ian is in my Patreon book club, and we ended up discussing this book, and so he sent it to me in the post. If you wanna join the Patreon book club, please join my Patreon. This is a book by Georges Perec, and I have to read it here because it's got a really long title. It's called An Attempt at Ex exhausting a place in Paris, and it's translated by Mark Lowenthal. Yuri Lowenthal is one of my favourite voice actors, so that's cool. He voiced Spider-Man in the new Insomniac Spider-Man game, and if you listen to the English dub of Gurren Lagann, he voiced Simone. Anyway, An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris is a tiny little pamphlet of a book, I read it in like an hour, and it covers three days over a long weekend where Georges Perec just sat in a cafe I can't remember where, somewhere in Paris in like the 1970s, and just observed. At the beginning of the book, he makes an argument that everywhere in Paris has been documented, all the great buildings, all the great squares, all the geography of the place, it's all been documented, but not the events of the place and the way that it is experienced. And so in a very pretentious, but really entertaining way, he sits and he observes. It's really good. I don't really know what the ultimate point of it was, but I certainly enjoyed the journey that he goes on, and it really is a tiny little pattern pamphlet of a book, and I, I really recommend it. It's really charming. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I don't know how long I've been talking. Don't know how long this video is. Sorry. French Lit is great. Modern French books. Check them out. Blah, blah, blah. Subscribe for books.